Head margaritas at 10 minutes. Hello, I'm Ursula Phoenix Ware, Deputy Associate Director for Communication Science with CDC's National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. Happy Valentine's Day and welcome to our Facebook Live, a heart-to-heart -heart chat, Living with a Heart Defect. Before we begin, I'd like to set some ground rules for the next half hour. Participants should type their questions into the comment section. And if we can't answer your question live, we'll try to post a written response later. If participants have trouble posting questions, please feel free to email us at ncbddinquiry at cdc.gov and we'll respond by email following the event. As a reminder, CDC cannot provide personal or individual medical advice. And lastly, the purpose of today is to foster dialogue and share information about congenital heart defects. So today we have several guests with us to discuss congenital heart defects for Congenital Heart Defects Awareness Week, which runs from February 7th through today the 14th. So I'm gonna turn it over to our panel now and allow them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Oster, a pediatric cardiologist at Sibley Heart Center at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. I also work with CDC on a variety of projects related to congenital heart defects. My name is Ken Woodhouse. I'm a 37-year-old from Chicago, Illinois. I've undergone two open heart surgeries for my heart defects, which are collectively referred to as Tetralogy of Fallot. My name is Marissa Mendoza. I'm a 22-year-old from New Jersey, and I underwent three open heart surgeries for my six heart defects, all before the age of two. I now work as a cardiac nurse. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with our conversation. We'll start with Dr. Oster, who's going to tell us about heart defects in general, and then we'll hear from our panelists, Ken and Marissa, who will share their stories on living with heart defects. At the end, we'll open it up to your questions. So Dr. Oster, starting with you, can you explain exactly what a congenital heart defect is? Certainly. So congenital heart defects are problems present at birth uh, with the formation and structure of the heart and how it works. Uh, and as a result, the heart can't pump blood or oxygen uh, to all the tissues sometimes. Uh, this could be, you know, problems with holes in the heart or problems with the valves or problems with how the vessels are formed in the heart or any combination of that. All right. And so uh, there are many different options to treat these heart defects once people have them. All right. So how many people are living with heart defects? Well, heart defects are the most common birth defect, and we estimate that there are about a million children living with heart defects uh, and about 1.4 million adults uh, in the United States. And CDC is working with a variety of partners around the country right now to get a better estimate on the numbers of people living with heart defects and perhaps more importantly, what are the issues addressing them as they grow older? I see. So how do you treat heart defects? Yeah, so it's a spectrum. All right. mm -hmm. Some heart defects are minor and might need, you know, just some medicines or possibly no treatment at all. Sure. Some are more severe and can require surgeries, interventions, or multiple surgeries mm -hmm. in, or interventions. So after an individual uh, has surgery, are they cured? In most cases, no. Uh, while a surgery can help to get the blood flowing in the right direction or allow the heart to pump uh, blood and oxygen to the rest of the body, mm -hmm. uh, over time there can be issues that arise. Um, mm -hmm. So it's important for people who, especially those who have had interventions for heart defects, to keep following up regularly with the cardiologist where they can look for problems with how the heart is functioning, with the heart rhythm, with any problems with the intervention that they had over time. All right. So Dr. Oster, what advice would you give people with heart defects so that they can take control of their individual health? It's a great question. Uh, there are a few things I, I like to tell people of heart defects. Mm -hmm. So first and most importantly, know your defect. Know what your condition is. Know what surgeries or medications you've had. Um, know your story. Okay? Know everything about your heart defect. And if your parent, make sure your child as they grow older knows everything about that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, just like people who aren't born with heart defects, mm -hmm. it's important to take care of your heart. Um, leading a healthy lifestyle. This means appropriate diet, of course, um, but also trying to do as much exercise as is recommended for your heart condition. So we uh, suggest to people with heart defects, talk with their doctor, find out what sort of exercises can they do? Do they have any limitations um, or they, can they do you know, what other normal kids can do? And then finally, um, most importantly also is stay in care or if you're out of care, 
come back to care. You know, as I said, there can be problems long term. So even though a person is feeling great and doing well, and that's our goal, and we love that, uh, we want to be monitoring them, be monitoring them, so that if problems arise, mm -hmm. we can treat them before they really start to affect a person's life. I see. Well, Dr. Oster, thank you for sharing your knowledge on heart defects. We have Ken and Marissa here who are going to share, share their individual experiences on living with congenital heart defects. So, Ken, I'm going to get started with you and sure. our questions. Can you tell us about your heart defect and how it's affected your life up until now? Absolutely. So, I was born in 1981 with a condition known as Tetralogy of Fallot, which is four separate defects to the heart. Uh, I had my first open heart surgery at the age of eight months old, which they call the complete repair. Um, I went about my life, had annual checkups as a youngster. Um, my parents are very insistent and very good about making sure I went for those checkups. Um, but with the exception of football, I had no restrictions. I was told to live an active life, be healthy, so I always loved the outdoors, loved being active, um, was always a fan of cycling. and. As I grew up, became more active with cycling and did some long distance rides. Um, and then kind of forgot that I was a heart patient, never really actively thought about it. Um, after high school, I went off to college and stopped going for annual checkups. I thought I was fixed, I thought I was cured. Mm -hmm. um, never really gave it much thought after that. Fast forward about 10 years in the fall of 2011. I was out on my bike for a ride one day after work, which is very common for me, um, but I didn't end up going home after that ride. I fell off my bike, had a concussion, um, was taken by ambulance to the ER, which I don't remember to this day. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, because I ride with an emergency medical bracelet that mentions my heart defect, uh, the doctors and the first responders were able to schedule some follow-up tests that fortunately, longer term, revealed um, an aneurysm in my pulmonary artery, which is the artery that leads, uh, that brings blood from the heart to the lungs. And it was suddenly very clear to me and I was reminded that I'm not fixed, that I'm not cured, and that I would require intervention uh, in the not too distant future and lifelong care. A couple years later, in January of 2014, I did have my second open heart surgery to repair that aneurysm and they also replaced my pulmonary valve, which had been leaking since I was born. And, and I've been very fortunate. Um, just over 100 days post-op, I ran a 5K, uh, clocked my personal best time, and, and I've been fortunate to be able to stay active. I'm, I'm back to cycling, I'm back to running, um, and I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and share awareness. And, Terrific. Well, thank you. Absolutely. What advice would you give other individuals that are living with a heart defect? The best advice I could give is to not follow my example when I was younger. Um, mm -hmm. Don't fall out of care. And like Dr. Oster said, if you find yourself out of care, um, do everything you can to come back into care. Um, and, and to parents for with children who have congenital heart defects, um, talk to them about their defect, educate mm -hmm. them. And, and, and talk to them and to their doctors about what the appropriate transition plan is as they get older and, and grow into adulthood. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Marissa, similar questions. So can you tell us about your heart defect and how it's affected your life up until now? Of course, so when I was born in 1996, my parents didn't know I had a heart condition. It wasn't until a few hours after my birth when I remained this dark, dusky, bluish reddish color where they realized something was wrong. So I was quickly rushed to a nearby heart and lung specialty hospital where I eventually underwent three open heart surgeries for my six complex congenital heart defects. Collectively, the surgeries were known as the Fontan procedure. So I am a single ventricle Fontan. Single ventricle meaning most people have two ventricles in their heart and those ventricles, one pumps blood to the body and one pumps blood to the lungs. So okay. instead of that two chamber system, I only have one on the bottom. I grew up and did not let my heart defects define me. Despite my cardiology appointments, my echoes, EKGs, I wore halter monitors, it, I didn't let it stop me. And while I was growing up, I enjoyed playing sports with a lot of my friends, mainly soccer. And my grandfather, he actually played soccer in the Olympics and the World Cup, so I, I intended to, to be like him. I wanted to 
go to college and play soccer and mm -hmm. then after college I was just going to play soccer. That was my, my original plan. And then I realized I was getting short of breath and I couldn't keep up with all of my friends while I was mm -hmm. playing. So because of that, I underwent my first exercise stress test around the age of 11, where I was told I could no longer play strenuous sports such as soccer. So that was really the very first time I felt like I had a heart condition. Mm -hmm. And it was, as I learned growing up, the first setback of many. But it was partially a good thing because it let me learn how to get through that and move on with life despite these obstacles. So following that restriction, I joined my school's show choir and chorus, and I also began taking piano lessons. And music is something that I still love today. For college, I went to school to be a nurse, and I just graduated in May. I, during school, though, uh, I had the amazing opportunity to work at the same heart and lung specialty hospital where I underwent my three open heart surgeries. Mm -hmm. and. What's even more special is that my nurse manager was actually one of my nurses during my multiple hospitalizations in, uh, when I was an infant. And that experience in itself is something that I, I can't even put into words. It was so amazing for me to be able to work with her. Um, right now, I am working at a different hospital as a cardiac nurse, but in the future, I hope to get back into the congenital heart defect side of things. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, congratulations on your graduation. Thank you. You're welcome. And what advice would you give other individuals that are living with a heart defect? So what I would always say is don't let your congenital heart defect define you. I never did. Of mm -hmm. course, you need to go to your doctor's appointments and continue with follow-up care and, and listen to what your cardiologist recommends for you. But don't let your congenital heart be defect be all that you are. That's, mm -hmm. that's not who you are as an individual. So that I, I tell that to everyone, just be you and then you can have the heart defect on the side, really. <laughs> um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I fell into Broadway shows and, and chorus and show choir after I was restricted from sports. And my favorite Broadway show, Dear Evan Hansen, uh, has a quote that I live by every day. And it's, all you gotta do is just believe you can be who you wanna be. And every morning I wake up and I follow that quote until the second I go to bed and I start over fresh the next morning. If I had let my heart condition define me, I wouldn't be anywhere close to where I am today, including right here talking to everyone about congenital heart defects. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for sharing your stories. Your stories highlight the importance of staying in care to keep your hearts healthy. So we'll now take some questions from the audience. Again, if we can't answer your question live, we'll try to post a written response later. All right. So we have been receiving questions during our conversation through the Facebook Live feed. And I'm going to go to the feed right now and see what has come in during our conversation. OK, the first question is for Dr. Oster. Let's see. I'd like to get us, let's see here. Should adults with heart defects be evaluated later in life, even if they have no symptoms and feel healthy? Dr. Oster. Yes, so you know, as I mentioned before, it's great that, we ha that we're seeing many children now grow up to be adults um, to live great lives, with, especially with some of our more severe heart defects. That didn't happen uh, many years ago. Uh, and we wanna keep that going. We want to you know, encourage them to have a very long productive life um, but problems can arise. Um, problems can arise when you least expect it, whether it's falling off a bike, whether it's, you know, many women come back into care when they all of a sudden get pregnant and start having problems. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we do want to see people coming back into care. I, I just had a family last week where the, a kid came in for an evaluation for like a heart murmur and he was fine, mm -hmm. um, but the mom had a scar on her chest. And she was just like, Ken, she thought she was fixed. But uh, she had had two surgeries as a kid. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but fortunately, we were able to get her back into care. And okay. so we want people who, especially if you had an intervention as a child, but if you were born with a heart problem, um, make sure you've seen a cardiologist uh, recently. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next question for Ken and Marissa. All right. What do you do when someone asks about your scar? Ken, we'll start with you. Sure, so that has changed quite a bit since I was younger. Um, when I was younger, I was very self-conscious about my scar. I 
never wanted to take my shirt off at a pool. I also have heard plenty of stories where I was afraid of Band-Aids sure. in general. Um, so I wanted to hide it. I didn't want to think about it. Um, but in the last few years since I fell back into care, um, I've become an advocate and um, very open about it. And if someone asks me about it, I will tell them as much or as little as they want. Um, and usually it's more than they want to know. Um, but, but, but I use it as a chance to, to share information because, you know, like Dr. Oster was saying, there's a lot of folks who fall out of care and, and, and think they are fixed. I was one of them. So, sure. so I try to, try to use that as a, as a teaching moment. My answer is uh, very similar to that, to be honest. When I was younger, I was embarrassed and self-conscious about my scars. So for, for gym class, I didn't like getting changed in front of all of my classmates. For pool parties, I would try not to swim in the pool, although mm -hmm. I used to love swimming. And then one day, it kind of just clicked for me, I guess, that it wasn't a sign of weakness, but instead of a sign of strength and empowerment. And now, I will go on and on for as long as anyone is willing to listen <laughs> about my scar, just because that's how you raise awareness and you, you tell your story to other people that want to learn. All right, thank you. Okay, so it looks like our next question is for uh, Dr. Oster again. And this individual is asking, what mental health challenges are often encountered by people with heart defects? Yes, so, you know, we, we think of congenital heart defects as just affecting the heart, mm -hmm. but part of the reason why we think of this as a lifelong condition, I wanna make people, make sure people are getting back into care, is over time we've realized that a defect that might affect structurally just the heart mm -hmm. can have implications on the rest of the body, other organs, including the brain. Okay. And with that, we can see, you know, starting in childhood, problems either with behavioral problems, developmental problems, problems in school, um, that can also manifest as children get older into adolescence and adulthood into, you know, mental health issues or PTSD or other things. Um, and, you know, it's a spectrum, you know, different people are affected different ways, mm -hmm. but we think it's important to recognize that people with heart defects are at a higher risk of having mental health problems okay. um, so that we can identify those, address them, um, and again, with the whole goal of allowing them to manage any mental health issues they have um, so they can have as uh, normal and as uh, healthy a life as they can. Do you have any experiences that you want to share? So I know for me throughout school I've done research and I've seen that uh, there are studies published on children and adults with congenital heart defects having higher incidences of anxiety, depression, and PT PTSD, excuse mm -hmm. me. So for me what comes into play is if I'm in a stressful situation, honestly, and I'll start getting chest pain and maybe some shortness of breath. I'll feel like my heart is racing fast or I might feel a little dizzy or lightheaded. Mm -hmm. And then in my mind, I'm wondering, is this all just because I'm, I'm a little stressed right now or is something wrong with my heart? So that just makes it 10 times worse. Sure. So for, for people like us, I feel like um, that can lead to emergency room visits and just the unknown, the fear of the unknown with that. And for me, I have ended up in the emergency room mm -hmm. for different situations like that. So it's really important to understand that, that illnesses such as those are really common in people like us with congenital heart defects. All right, thank you. I think there's one more thing I would add to that if I could sure. is you know, one of the challenges for a lot of folks with congenital heart defects is you can go through very long periods of feeling perfectly normal and healthy. So when when I got back into care and was, was getting ready for my second open heart mm -hmm. surgery, I felt completely asymptomatic. Okay. I didn't feel short of breath, I didn't feel ill. So it's, it becomes a mental minefield for why me? Mm -hmm. Why do I have to go through this? I feel okay, I just was out biking, I was just out running. Why do I have to go in for this major surgery? So it's this thought of, you know, th this isn't real. And then it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of dealing with the mental aspect of accepting and owning the fact that it is real and it is something that you need to take care of. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, Ken and Marissa again, this question is from Let's see, the National Birth Defects Prevention Network. 
and they're asking, do either of you experience any mental health issues as a result of living with a heart defect? Ken? That's a really good question, but I don't, I don't think that I do other than what I just spoke about, feeling apprehensive to accept ownership of, of not being fixed and knowing that even at the moment, I feel perfectly fine. And the last, the last checkup I had, the mm -hmm. prognosis was fantastic, but that could change at any moment. Sure. You know, and like Dr. Oster said earlier, sometimes there are things bubbling under the surface. So it's important to just keep it monitored because, because unfortunately the reality is that that could change at any moment. Mm -hmm. And for me, in a way, I'm very lucky that my surgeries were um, performed before I turned two years old, so I don't remember any of that. And in the past few years, I've had minor things, such as a cardiac catheter catheterization or just little things like that. So fortunately, I don't feel I, I deal with the PTSD aspects of living with congenital heart defects. What comes into play for me, like I mentioned previously, would be um, knowing that I have a heart condition and then feeling symptoms of chest pain or shortness of breath and then I'm wondering is, is something wrong with my heart? Should I go to my cardiologist or is, is this normal? Do, do normal people experience this too? Not okay. that we're not normal, but do people <laughs> without the congenital heart defect experience it too? Sure. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this next question is for Dr. Oster again and uh, this viewer is from Spain and they're asking any prevalence data of neurological complications due to congenital heart defects? Yes, there, there actually is a lot of data about that. Um, in fact, you know, in children it's recommended, um, especially those who have more severe defects who mm -hmm. require surgery um, during infancy, um, that they get monitored um, for that. So actually in our, in our center, certain kids even before a year of age will undergo some pretty um, intensive neurodevelopmental testing to make mm -hmm. sure they're on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, and then kids when they're older and are going into school age, um, you know, we'll do other testing as well to make sure they're getting any services they need. Do they need special education services? Do they even have minor learning disabilities okay. that um, aren't recognized? Uh, and but then again, this is a lifespan approach. This does go across into the lifespan. Um, Different, you know, everyone's different. It's important to be aware of that. Um, but there are some data that, as uh, you know, adults with heart defects age, that they can have some of the neurologic issues that affect the elderly, but at an earlier time, so an earlier onset. Uh, so it's important um, just to be aware of these. Um, and if someone who has a, has a heart defect has concerns, just to get checked out. Okay, great. All right. So this next question is. Uh, for Ken Marissa and Dr. Oster, and it's from Samantha Aaron, and she'd like to know, what do you want people to know about adults living with CHD? So, so that's, for me, the big thing that I try to tell everyone is that it's, it's not just our heart. We were born with these heart conditions, these congenital heart defects, but that it doesn't only impact our hearts. We can have different issues in our liver, in, as we mentioned, mental health problems, neurocognitive issues. The, the list is endless. And um, that's, I always try to share that with everyone, just because if somebody is having trouble walking up a flight of stairs, they might not understand why. Sure, their, their lungs might not be able to work at the same capacity as someone else. Or for me personally, my heart condition can lead to liver issues. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I try to, to steer clear of alcohol and, and people my age, they don't really understand that. So that's what I, I try to explain to everyone that it's not just my heart, it's, it's my whole entire person that's impacted by these congenital heart defects. Okay. Yeah, one thing I would add to that is um, there is no universal answer. Mm. There are so many different defects and every single patient is different even within an individual defect. So there's been times when I've, I've met other patients with Tetralogy of Fallot and they mm -hmm. hear my story, they want to know why, why they don't have the same outcome. Or yes. you know, they say, I get winded walking up a flight of stairs, mm -hmm. why? Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, just the need for personalized care because no two stories are the same. Sure. So um, just because I'm incredibly fortunate to have my story Unfortunately, that's not true for everyone. Other people have 
far more success with their stories than I've had. So it's, it's all individual. So just because you have a similar diagnosis or you have a CHD or multiple CHDs, there's, there's not a one size fits all answer. Um, so it is important to get that specialized care. Absolutely. Okay. I would say I like the, how she used the term adults living with CHD. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great that in this day and age we're talking about so many adults um, and we're focusing on the adult as a whole and CHD is one component of it as Marissa mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. was talking about. And you know, we want adults living with CHD to get into care, stay in care, whatever works for you. You know, my patients who have, you know, who need annual visits, I try to anchor it to their birthday. So every year they have a birthday, they remember that's the day I'm coming. Some like to come around their heart anniversary, which is the term they call when they had their surgery. Um, but whatever works for you, stay in care. And you might say, oh, but I feel fine. Trust me, nothing makes me happier that, than having someone come in who have taken care for a while and I do nothing. <laughs> I just say, you're great, go have another wonderful year, I'll mm -hmm. see you in a year. Mm -hmm. um, because our goal here is to allow you to live as normal a life as possible. Uh, and there are many people thriving with CHD out mm -hmm. there that you may not realize. There are you know, people who are winning gold medals in sure. uh, you know, the Olympics or people playing on national soccer mm -hmm. teams or there are people um, you know, who are doctors and doing normal lives that you wouldn't know um, mm -hmm. until they took their shirt off and you know, you'd see their scar. So uh, you know, thriving and living with CHD I think is a great thing um, that we're seeing these, these days. Great. Well, our questions are continuing to come in. And the next one appears to be for Dr. Oster again. And it's from Teresa Bohannon. And she'd like to know, can you discuss how epidemiology can help move the field, especially when so many kids have various defects that make a large scale study difficult? And she adds, P.S. I love seeing, <laughs> seeing single ventricle patients like Marissa. It gives her hope for her son. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So that's a very uh, interesting question. And, you know, it's important for us, you know, for, so for epidemiology, what exactly does that mean? That can mean different things to different people. Um, for us, it really just means, you know, studying the health of a population. And now, you know, as I mentioned, there are over 2.4 million people in the United States living with congenital heart defects. And we need to learn, especially, you know, as people are getting into adulthood more and more, what are the issues that are affecting them? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do, you know, I, I work with CDC in a variety of projects. We're trying to do a, a large survey to understand more um, about this. Um, and we're trying to capture as many people as possible because everyone is different. Sure. Everyone is gonna have different issues. Sure. But we wanna use tools like this and studying the services people use so that our society can be better prepared to meet the needs of this population um, as they continue to grow. Okay, great, right. thank you. Okay, so it looks like we have time for one more question. And let's see what we have. And this is for everyone. Uh, how can parents of a child with a heart defect help them stay as healthy as possible? Let's start with you, Marissa. So I think it's really important for parents to help their children learn about their heart defect, help them understand what they have, what this means for their future. And like Dr. Oster mentioned earlier, it's, it's important for us along with everyone to just eat healthy, stay healthy, sure. be active if you can, as long as you don't have those restrictions. So mm -hmm. from the parents, it's, it's just important that they share with their child what they'll need to know while they're growing up, which is their diagnosis, their medications, and how they can take care of themselves as a whole. Okay, great, thank you, Ken. And I think to add to that, once, once that base layer is established, allow the kid to be a kid. Mm -hmm. um, once you know what is allowed, what's not allowed in terms of physical activity, let them do it. Let them be a kid. I've, I've met a lot of folks who, as adults feel like they were kept in this protective bubble mm -hmm. out of genuine care from their parents, but unnecessarily. Now we're at a place where there's so much medical information out there and there's so much knowledge. You know, get that from your doctors, get that from your cardiologists and, and celebrate it. You know, focus on what you can do. You know, you're, you're a fantastic example. You had a restriction from competitive sports, so you right. thrived in music. Mm -hmm. I think that's great, and I would encourage all parents to, to focus on the positive as much as they can for their kids and for themselves. Okay, thank you. Yes. 
Wow, I'm not sure I have much to add beyond <laughs> what Ken and Marissa did. Those are great answers. Uh, but yes, you know, in, in empowerment and encouragement, I think, are two big words um, and two big areas that parents can use with their children. So first, empowering them, as we said, to take control of this, recognize you were born with this heart defect, mm -hmm. but it doesn't define you. It's part of who you are. It's part of your whole person. Sure. Um, but then encouragement. Encourage them to get out into the world, to you know, work with their doctor, to figure out what sort of activities are okay for them. You know, we were talking earlier, I you know, had some families where the kid had a single ventricle and wanted to go on a roller coaster. We're like, wow, should let them do that? We have all these signs. We said, yeah, live your life. You can do that. You're healthy. You're doing great. Sure. So um, everyone's different. Mm -hmm. Talk to your doctor, figure out what's right for you. Mm -hmm. But empowerment and encouragement, I think, are uh, two very important take-home messages for parents. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, we're about out of time. I'd like to thank Dr. Oster, Ken, and Marissa for joining us, and thank you to all of you who've tuned in. We'd also like to thank the Adult Congenital Heart Association for their support of this event. In closing, we want to highlight that ongoing cardiac care can help children and adults with a heart defect live as healthy as possible. For more information on heart defects, visit cdc.gov forward slash heart defects. Thank you for joining us.